Hey, look who's here. What's going on, Business Athlete Nation? We're sitting here on a Wednesday. We got a guest in the chair. So there's your 12 second hook. We got somebody here. Not just Uncle Keith here today, not just the Chief Bapley. You have somebody else's voice to keep you company today, not just my own. Something powerful about that. Hey, I got a lot of energy. Today. I'm excited today. I'm amped up today. Um, you know, you guys know I'm in Winnipeg. It's a balmy zero degrees. Yeah. We're going suntanning after the show. Speaking of the show, John Fallis joining us today. Ad veteran, marketing ad veteran, ad agency guy. Guy's been fired seven times. Don't want to tell you. Not once, not twice, not 10, just seven. Just seven. So we're going to talk about that. You know how I like to go the moment behind the moment. Well, we can ask John that question seven times and learn about the moment behind the moment behind the moment. So we're going to have a wonderful conversation. John apparently did a little bit of homework on Uncle Keith over here. He's like, hey, Keith. I should be interviewing you after I did my homework on you. I'm like, all right, let's have a conversation. So we might have a little bit of fun today because, you know, we know, you know, it's a pretty boring show here in the lab. We just sit here and we inform, we bore. Hell no, we entertain and we inform. That's what we do. So today, before we get into John, I got a couple of minute monologue that I want to throw at you guys today. And it is having to do with what you saw today's post, how I learned to lead through a camera lens. My whole career has been doing this, talking to a camera. Yeah, it's, it's not extroverted, not introverted. I'm camera averted. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm so used to talking to a camera into a microphone. It's just all I do. As I, it's like I say to my kids, hey, just wear a camera and I'll communicate with you that way. It seems to work for me any other way. But hey, I want to talk today. There's a lot of buzz. Well, there's been a lot of buzz for a long time, but a lot of buzz around leadership and be more productive with your remote team. So if you have a remote team, if you have a remote workforce, hybrid workforce, a workforce that's not right in front of you, they're all over the place. They're distributed. Well, admittedly, leadership is maybe different. And for some of you, some of you business athletes there in Bapple Nation, maybe you aren't used to it. You sit back and you go, ah, fuck, man, I don't like this remote stuff. Ah, I wish everybody was around me. People were in the office. No, you don't. There's ways that you could be better at working with your community that's not around you. And here's the frank reality. If you as a leader feel like you're having to manage your people, people honest to god do we still gotta manage people do we still have to manage people no if you're managing people fire them go hire the right people and then lead them key difference lead empower support and set them free that's what you want to do so hey some tips you know how we like to give nuggets here in the lab some tips to lead your team in a productive workforce a remote workforce hey asynchronous videos if you try them asynchronous videos Powerful. Use them. I was reminded of it by my guest a couple months back, Ari Mizell, the leader in asynchronous videos. It's one thing to send a text, but it's another thing to get in front of the camera. Chief Baplet here in front of the camera. Get in front of the camera. Say what you have to say. Deliver it with your enunciation, your emotion, your clarity, and send it to your teammate. And then have them get on it, right? Loom's a great desktop tool for asynchronous video. But don't be afraid to use a synchronous video. It'll move your life forward. Here's another tip for you. Stay on a problem until it's solved. Actually, if you're going to a meeting to solve a problem, you do one of two things. Don't end the meeting until the problem is solved. Because if you're ending the meeting before the problem is solved, then why do you have the meeting in the first place? Think about that. And if you're having an end time on your meeting, what you're saying is that, okay, we only have 60 minutes to solve this problem. You don't know if it's going to take you 60 minutes. It might take you six years. The point is, do not move forward until you solve that one problem or you'll never solve it. You'll just keep problems popping up over and over and over, which leads to the next one. You always wanna have a next step, always. So again, if you've solved the problem, assume there's something gonna happen next. When John and I are done talking today, there's gonna be a next step. We're gonna set up a next cat and conversation, a next coffee, an email, a, a way to stay in touch. There's always a next step. Here's a big one. And maybe this is just cliche at this point, but get rid of PowerPoint. Like actually get, <laughs> John will like this, coming from the ad world, the creative world. Just get rid of the fucking PowerPoint, man. Just get rid of it. Embrace critical thinking. Oh, critical thinking. Yeah. Put some thought into your words. Articulate your words. Put a paragraph together. Put all your thoughts together in a note, in a document. Share it with your team in advance of your meeting. Give them time to read it, digest it, and then go to the meeting and discuss it. If you're putting a PowerPoint together, you're just being lazy. You're putting bullet points on a piece of paper, putting some photographs next to it and saying, hey, here's my ideas. Now let's all just talk about it. Hello, ad world. Hello, creative world. Hello, marketing world. Don't even get me started on that. How much office space is all over North America being filled up by people making PowerPoints? Like, honest to God, 
Honest to God, expect results from your team, not hours worked. If you have a remote workforce, don't worry about managing, don't worry about what they're doing. Just worry about the results they're giving you. If they're off climbing mountains or achieving personal goals or building personal audiences while they're achieving the results for your organization, you got a rock star working for you. Actually, what I would do is I would empower them to be the greatest human being ever. I would empower them to make themselves the greatest biggest personal brand ever. That's what I would do. I would empower my people so that they were rock stars, superstars, superheroes, and focus on getting the results from them, not on how many hours they're putting. If they could put one hour a week in and give me the results I need, good. Go put 39 hours into something else. Good for you. Teach me how you do it. And hey, if the people you hired aren't working well for you, you got to take those responsibilities on for yourself. If you're going to fire them, it's your fault, not theirs. It's actually your fault. So before you hire somebody, make sure they're the right person. Don't just settle for a warm heartbeat because if you're firing them, it's your fault. It's absolutely your fault. And then what I would encourage you to do, if you are going to fire them, obsess over getting them their next job. That is awesome. Obsess over it. Say, hey, John, I'm sorry it didn't work out. John, what I want to do is I want to help you get that next step. It's not working out here. I erred. I I messed up. I I just didn't get it done for you. It's just not going to fit. So I want to get you your next role here. Let's find you a headhunter. Let's find you a next, like, let's, let's help you out. That's an awesome thing to do. Push the button of the human. We also focused on tech and AI and tech and AI. We're all still human at the end of the day. Push their buttons. Learn what buttons to push. Emotionally connect to them. Treat them. Here's cliche. Treat them how you want to be treated. It's true. The more kind you are to them, the probably the more kind they're going to be back to you. The more results they're going to give you. A couple last tips. If you're working remotely, do not let getting together happen by accident. Use tools like Roam, new technology allows you to know where everybody's at and get together. Plan get-togethers, plan virtual meetings, plan physical meetings, but plan for it. Don't let it happen by accident. Your time, Mr. Leader, your time, Mrs. Leader, compounds your human's time. If you can find five minutes of your day to give it to John, John's going to go, holy smokes, Keith just gave me five minutes. John's now jacked up for the next 24 hours. Because John just fed off my energy. John's like, oh my God, I just got five minutes with the boss. I'm feeling really good. He likes what I'm doing right now. And I'm thinking, I'm like, I don't want to spend time with John. You know what you do though? Go spend time with John. When you go spend time with John, John's like, yeah, I got that energy. I'm going to work. Your time compounds your human's time. Go and give them your time. And last but not least, the compound latency in your business, it's your problem, not your team's problem. I've given you every single reason before this last one that should eliminate any compound latency. What's compound latency? When things are moving forward because you feel like time's moving backwards. Think about it. Hey, you know what I said? I sit here Monday to Monday with all the energy. Live in the lab with Keith Billis, X, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We're going to bring in John Follis now. He's been sitting patiently while I've been rattling off my monologue this morning. He's sitting there in the green room. You know how it works. So I'm going to pivot that way. We're going to bring John in here. And we're going to have a good chat with the guy who's been fired a few times. John Follis, ad agency, marketing agency, veteran. I think he's been to the White House too. Let's bring him in. John, I am awesome. I need to get the music paused here, get it turned down. Oh, there you are. Hey, I, I'm awesome, man. H- how are you doing? I am great, but I have to correct you on the intro you gave for me, you gave me way too much credit. I was only fired four times, four times in seven years. I think that's where you got the seven. Oh, four times. Okay. So, okay. So sorry that you <laughs> yeah, way too much credit. <laughs> well, f- four times is better than seven, of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> where do you join us today? So I purposely do not, you know, do big intros for my guests because at the end of the day, I think the guests can do the best intro for themselves. Where are you joining us today? And then the second part of that question is tell my audience who you are. Yeah, I am about uh, 40 minutes outside of New York City in Stanford, Connecticut. And uh, as you mentioned, my background is in advertising. I worked in New York City for most of my career, but I had to kind of work my way up to it because I'm not a city guy. And I was kind of, uh, even though I grew up about an hour and a half outside of New York, I grew up in a, in a pretty uh, rural area. So uh, New York City to me was like a, uh, a foreign country. So uh, I kind of worked my way up to it, started out in Atlanta, Georgia, a couple of years in Chicago. And then I finally made my way to New York because that was the big leagues, right? Yeah. So I uh, spent about 25 years uh, working and living in Manhattan. And uh, as you mentioned, I started out working for some big agencies, some of the, the, the biggest and the best agencies in New York. But, um, you know, I, the reason I got fired, I should put this out there. And you kind of when you were talking in your intro, um, it really helps if the company that you're working, you're working for someone who wants you to be there. And in two of the times I got fired, the guy that 
hired me at those agencies left pretty quickly after he brought me in, maybe a month or so. And New York City and the ad business is a very cutthroat business. And if the guy who wants you to be at that company, who hired you at that company, is no longer there to help you and nurture you and and yeah. and help you succeed, it's you're you're like a bastard child. And it's it not does it doesn't mean it's a death sentence, but it does mean that it's not going to be easy. And so that happened two of the four times I, I got uh, terminated. Well, but, it's like it's like, it's like the sports business, isn't it, John? It's like a coach, you know. So, if I'm the general manager of my Winnipeg Jets and I brought you in, exactly. and I get fired, uh, sure. there's somebody else bringing their own coach in, right? Same in politics, right? You know, a new president doesn't want to, you know, keep the old guys in there. So, that, you know, it, it it makes sense. But at the time, I I didn't fully understand it because I was, you know, in my 20s, and I thought there was something wrong with me. I didn't. I wasn't able to see the big picture, which I do now. Uh, but, you know, um, it actually turned out to be uh, the first step toward my success, the success I had in my career, because I really never had success working at those big agencies because uh, no one really gave me an opportunity at those big agencies. And it wasn't until I began freelancing after getting fired a couple of times that yeah. I was able to find my, my way. Uh, by working for for some c smaller agencies that really valued what I could bring to the table, and as a result, um, I was able to uh, showcase my my talents and attracted a business partner as a direct result of that. It's always better when, rather than chasing after people, when people come to you because of a reputation. You know, that's it's the same same thing in sales. It's always better to attract than it is to try to uh, you know chase after people and convince them and. I attracted a, a very aggressive uh, business guy who found, heard about my reputation, creative reputation. And after 20 minutes meeting for a beer said, hey, we should start an agency. I think we could really be a success. So I wasn't so sure about that, but we started collaborating and very quickly won our first client. And over the next two or three years, uh, built an agency that in about three three or four years became one of the most successful award-winning agencies in New York, which kind of blew my mind because I, you know, after getting fired all those times, you start wondering whether or not you have the talent. But once again, I was with, I had a business partner who um, saw things the same way I did, wanted us to be successful, realized my talent was really good at getting meetings with clients. And as we result of that, we became very successful very quickly. What did you, when you first sat down for coffee with your, with your partner and you guys sat back and, and discussed, you know, starting the agency, did you have an audience identified who you guys were going to go after right off the bat? Well, he was the one that brought it up. I, I didn't know the guy from Adam. The, 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 here's the other thing I should mention, um, which I think you'll, you'll appreciate. It's, it's always important to know who you're talking to, mm -hmm. which is why when you asked me um, prior to our, our, us going live, whether or not I knew about your, your podcast, um, I think any business person really needs to do their homework. And if they're meeting with someone, know who they're talking to. So he was referred to me and knew all about me and my creative reputation. Um, I was just responding to him when he called me out of the blue and introduced himself as a business guy who wanted to meet and talk about stuff. I really, I didn't really know who he was. I, I was open to always talking to new people, business people. But when we spoke, I really knew next to nothing about him. So when he brought up the idea of, us collaborating and trying to start an agency literally after about 20 minutes of talking. Um, part of me was flattered. Part of me thought this guy was crazy, you know, because I didn't realize that um, he thought I was the second coming of Jesus Christ based on what he had heard from right. other people and what he had seen in my work. And I, I, again, and also I had a creative portfolio so I could, I was there showing my work. All, all I was able to see it with this guy was how he presented himself and the, you know, the $300 suit he was wearing. Um, so I, I didn't know what to think when he brought up that idea. Um, I just thought, okay, this guy is aggressive. He's obviously in love with me. And uh, let's see if he could get some meetings and take it from there. So that's, that's all I was thinking. And the rest is history, as I like to say it. Not, yeah, wasn't that that... <laughs> Simple. The first few months, he um, he got a couple of meetings with clients doing brochures and some crappy work. And yeah, 
I wasn't really into doing brochures. I wanted to do stuff that, you know, had some money behind it, had some media behind it and, you know, could showcase my, my creative work, my thinking. And that wasn't going to be in a brochure. So, um, I wasn't, I wasn't so convinced that he was going to be partner material until about maybe five months into our collaboration when he got a meeting with a client who wanted to do a TV commercial and put some money behind it. And we ended up, we and we were competing against, I think, four other uh, established ad agencies. And we were two guys working out of our apartments, right? So um, because it was a, a creative shootout, which is often what happens when you're pitching business, the client says, okay, show me some ideas and I'll make a decision based on what I think is the best idea. So I knew that even though we were not an established agency, I knew that we had a real shot because yeah. uh, I knew my creative was going to be good and mm -hmm. had a chance of beating out these other Establish ad agencies, and that's what happens. So once we um, we won that account, Keith, um, that was a significant piece of business. And then we had to start talking about formalizing the partnership and finding office space and actually uh, moving forward uh, with our agency. Yeah, you've been to the White House. Talk about that experience. That was one of the craziest, flukiest, wildest experiences. I mean. When you think of people that get invited to the White House, you don't think of ad guys, right? <laughs> no, unless you you're of, John Hamm, part of Mad Men or something, right? You know, maybe, you maybe think of war heroes or people yeah. who, you know, cured cancer or something yes. like that, you know, invented yeah. something, right? Yeah. So, um, who was the sitting president at the time? What's that? Who was the president at the time? This was this one. I'm going to date myself. This was in the early 90s, Keith. So, George Bush, the first, was president. Or oh, not even George W. We're talking George H. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so All again, right. I, I'm. Uh, I. I know. I look like I'm. You know, 50 years old, but I'll be 70 in in uh, in a few months. Um. So, that's who the president was, and we we did a campaign. Um. One of the things I always tried to make time for Keith was uh, public service work. Mm -hmm. Um. So I started uh, getting. I my partner and I. My partner and I. Um or I should say I, I started, I came up with some ideas for some child abuse ads that uh, my partner got excited about. And um, we tried to find an organization that might consider running these, these, this ad that I came up with. And he contacted this organization, the head, the head child abuse, the main child abuse or national child abuse organization in the U S is based in Chicago. And, um, I don't know what he was thinking because they were in Chicago, we were in New York, and uh, we really wanted to meet with them. We didn't want to just show them, mail them an idea. This was this was pre-internet, Keith. That's again how how old I am. But he called them up and they said he said they said that they were coming to New York for a meeting, and the meeting they were coming to New York for was with the NBA, the National Basketball Association. They didn't say why. They just said we're coming, we're meeting with the NBA, and we're that's happening in two weeks. So. You can meet us at the NBA offices and show us your idea. And uh, we, I mean, it's so the story gets even stranger than that. We went up to the NBA offices and found ourselves in a meeting, not just with these two executives from the child abuse organization, but about five people from the NBA sitting around a conference table. And I didn't understand why they were. I thought it was just we, they're going to pull us over to the side. Uh We'd have a, our 10 minute meeting with them. We show them the yeah, but now I'm around a table with most of the people were NBA people. And now I'm presenting to them and they don't really know who we are. And I don't know why we're talking to them as well. And we show them the ad and the, the child abuse people say, well, it's not really what we want to do, but we want to talk to you about something else. Mm -hmm. They said the NBA just agreed to give us $5 million worth of TV time during their NBA playoffs. And we need some commercials to run. Oh, geez. Are, are you interested? So $5 million worth of media time in 91 is probably worth about 10 million uh, media time now. Well, at least. <laughs> so now that I look back on it, their, their main me reason for meeting with us was not so much for us, for them to see the idea that we presented. They were closing, they were um, finishing up a deal with the NBA uh -huh. that would give them this free media time to air some TV spots. And they needed a New York agency that would be willing to collaborate with the NBA to do some TV commercials because the NBA wanted to stay involved. They wanted their players on the commercials. Mm -hmm. so, you know, as a sports guy, you'll find this interesting. Mm -hmm. So they said, are you interested? And I said, 
not if the whole commercial is just going to be an NBA player reading from a teleprompter to the camera. Right. And they looked at us like we were fucking crazy. Can I say that? Absolutely. You just did. Okay. <laughs> um, I said, listen, we, we are an award-winning creative agency. We understand that you want NBA players in your TV spots, but we don't think that the most impactful way to communicate a message about child abuse is just having a talking head <laughs> with a kid on his lap, maybe reading off of a teleprompter, regardless of how, of how great the copy is. You know, if you want us to do what we do best and come up with a really great creative idea with impact, and then somehow integrate your NBA player in the spot, we'd be willing to do that. But not if you just want to tell us it's got to be one of your players talking for 30 seconds. And they looked at us, they look kind of looked at each other because I, I don't think they were expecting to hear that, but they, uh, uh, with a bit of hesitation said, okay, you know, show us some ideas. And the thing was, here's the other thing, Keith, they didn't have a lot of time to screw around. I didn't realize this because this was maybe, I don't know, a couple of months before the playoffs. So they were kind of be behind the eight ball in getting an agency on board to, to make this happen, to produce, help produce these spots. So again, I, I didn't realize any of this at the time, but they were kind of pressured to, to uh, not to kind of dick around and, you know, interview other agencies. They, we, we seemed like good guys. We were creative and they said, okay. And we came up with some spots that um, reached 28 million people during the five weeks of, of the playoffs wow. during that yeah. year. And um, really not only reached a lot of people, but were very effective in getting response, getting a lot of people to respond and contact the child abuse organization. They had an 800 number that people could call. And at the end of it, um, I still don't know how it happened, Keith, but about uh, two months after that, I get a letter from the White House in the mail that I thought was a joke. I thought it was someone looking for work and they were trying to get my attention and they you know, got me to open the letter because it had the White House as a return address. And uh, I opened it up and there's this fancy embossed invitation with gold embossed lettering. And it says, you are cordially invited to a White House reception because we want to honor people like you who are making America better. You know, can, you know, please RSVP. And it was from the first lady who at the time was Barbara Bush. And they made it, Barbara Bush and George, the, the Bush White House is making it a pro priority to acknowledge people around the United States who they felt were, were doing good things for the for the uh, for the public good. So it wasn't just me and my partner it was me, my partner and a, a couple dozen other people. But that's the story behind the White House invitation. What would you say to somebody who wanted to go to the White House today? Go and enjoy it. Like if you had to go back and relive that experience, it would have happened so quickly. You know, you're in the moment. Next thing you know, you're there, you're in, you're out, and it's over with. So if you had to go back and relive that, what would you say to yourself or to somebody who's going to go? Enjoy it. I mean, yeah. it's it's probably, you know, I've won a lot of advertising awards and I see that all that stuff, but nothing compares to being invited and invited to and acknowledged at the white house for something good that you did for, Absolutely. you know, the country. Yeah. Yeah. John, I'm a big legacy person. I, I like, you know, being able to create things and a builder, create things and leave them for others to enjoy. You look at your work, you have touched a lot of America's, the world's biggest brands. You've worked with them. You're creative, your brain, your mind, your artistry has created content to help sell content and help do things for some of the world's biggest brands. When you sit back and reflect upon that, what's that feel like? Well, you know, I go back to what I said, was saying earlier, Keith, um, some of the brands that I did work on at those big agencies like Pizza Hut and Volkswagen uh, and Coke um, doesn't mean that I got work produced. <laughs> right. right. You know, because um, it's like I said, it's very, very competitive. And if the guy that uh, wants you to succeed at those agencies, the creative director you're working for is, is not there, um, very difficult to succeed and get work produced. So, yeah, I did work on a lot of those big brands, but um, really didn't get much produced at all at those big agencies. It wasn't until I started my own business. Uh, we worked on some some mid-sized brands, but nothing like Coke or VW or Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, yeah, listen, the satisfaction I got was um, making our clients happy and doing work that got results, regardless whether it was a big brand or, 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 or something that people 
a lot of people didn't even know about. The fact that our, my, our work and the creative ideas that I came up with got the response that the client hired us to do um, just gave me a lot of satisfaction because it was good for the client. It was good for us. And we worked with clients that really, I think, respected the creative um, the creative brand that our agency was about. They re- they were small guys. Many times they didn't have huge budgets. So they realized they needed the kind of work that would cut through, that would get attention. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so when our, cl- when our clients did approve our work, more often than not, it was stuff that uh, was, was press worthy. So it, it helped us as an agency to get a lot of press because it was edgy work and it was successful, successful for the client. So that's what really gave me satisfaction. John, do you spend a lot of time paying much attention to the industry today? Uh, a, a little bit. Um, you know, there's, there, I have so many other interests right now. Uh, so um, there's only a couple of campaigns that I find interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I got a kick out of discovering about a year ago that there's a Christian organization in the U.S. that decided that um, Jesus needs a makeover. I don't know if you guys know about this in Canada. I don't know if many people even in the U.S. know about this, this campaign. But uh, it's something that kept popping up in my uh, YouTube feed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found out why, because they they claim to be have spent a hundred million dollars on this campaign the first year, which included a lot of video on YouTube. And they even get this, Keith, they even in last year's Super Bowl uh, paid twenty million dollars to run two TV spots on the Super Bowl for this this campaign. It's called He Gets Us. I don't know if you've heard of it, but the he and he gets us is Jesus. And the, basically the, the 60 second spots were about how how cool Jesus is and you should go to their website and uh, which was he gets us.com or something and get involved in some Bible classes and go back to church and all this stuff. So that campaign really got my attention What? Uh, because I thought it was, it was very unique. So I'm curious because I wonder when I hear something like that, here's what gets me curious because I'm, again, I'm, I'm a moment behind the moment and then ask the question behind the moment. That that sounds to me very distinctly like a narrative propaganda type campaign that there is a larger reason for it. Now, I'm not here to make judgment on spirituality or Christianity or religion or whether people want to invest in Jesus or whatever. It just, you know, when you explain it to me, you know, and the amount of money being spent on it, it would seem that there's a larger narrative perhaps being presented to the marketplace than what we are thinking is being presented to them. I mean, you know, to, again, to answer your question, most, most commercials I could give a shit about for Doritos yeah. or beer or whatever. Yes. yes. But um, when I saw this campaign, I mean, who spends a hundred million dollars advertising yeah. Jesus and get this Keith, uh, you know, I, I immediately did started doing some research on this campaign for the reasons you just mentioned. Yes. The, the guy behind the campaign said, that's only the first year, the hundred million dollars. That's only the first year. Over the next three years, their goal, get this, a billion, Whoa. a freaking billion. So I'm thinking, who are these people and where do they get that kind of money? And why are they really doing this? Really? Right? Yes. So, I mean, I, I so again, long story to answer your question. Most campaigns I don't care about for obvious reasons, but this was so interesting and unusual and cur- curiosity um, uh, uh, motivating. I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm still intrigued by it. I actually just wrote an article. Um, I'd love. I used to write for Adweek. I used to be a columnist for Adweek, and I, I kind of miss having the opportunity to have a regular column getting published. So. I recently wrote an article saying um, to to try to bring, you know, they're targeting a lot of these people in the U.S., these, these young millennials and Gen Zers who have want to have nothing to do with religion and church. And these are the people they're they're targeting with this uh, campaign. And my my comment was it would take it would take a miracle for this Jesus campaign to uh, get these these kids to go back to to church and religion. Um, so. Um, now I got to find a, a, a good uh, blog or, or publication to get that published. But it makes me wonder whether at the end of the day, if you, if you chased the trail of money, whether that money ends up on, in a Democratic bank account or a Republican bank account. Well, there, there you go. There you it's go. Um, one of them. It's got to end up in one of them because we're trying to, 
That, and that's what fascinates me about the world of AI that we're moving into. And everybody's so worried about, you know, immediate content and immediate job loss. What really makes me curious and fascinates me yeah. is, and you coming from the ad world, you know where I'm going to go with this, is long-term narrative control, long-term narrative change, right? Yeah. Subtly changing languaging today to mean something in 2028. Do you know what I mean? Like, like well, a the, the a evangelicals in this country are so enmeshed with the Republican Party mm -hmm. and the people behind this campaign are evangelicals. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hard for me uh, not to think that as much as they want to have young millennials and Gen Zers in the U.S. learn more about Jesus, that they also want to do whatever they can to uh, get Trump elected. Again, that's just my cynical, you know, look at this. So um, that's it, it's just a very it's a fascinating to me. It's just a fascinating campaign to uh, to learn about and and comment on, which is why. I wrote this article commenting on it and would love to get it uh, published because I, I think it, some people in the U.S. know about it. But listen, they may be on the Super Bowl again in another three weeks. They did it last year. They mm -hmm. said that their goal is to spend a billion. So there's a very good chance in three weeks we're going to be see, seeing some more uh, cam more ads for Jesus on the Super Bowl. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your take on generative AI and its ability to create content and, and, and its impact on the creative industry, you being a veteran of the creative industry yeah. and, and these tools now having the ability to literally upend that entire industry? So when I was active in my career, which I am not now, mm -hmm. uh, I made it my business to pay attention to the evolving media landscape. As I mentioned to you uh, prior to our uh, going live, Keith, um, when I started hearing about podcasting in 2005, it was kind of like what AI is is right now, right? It was like, that's that was all the buzz, that was the rage. And I made it my business to learn about it. And in early 2006, I had a podcast show, which I did for seven years. It was the marketing show with John Fala. So I, I, I made it my business to keep up with that stuff because I'm really more interested right now in, in playing tennis and uh, getting a rock band together. Um, I have not <laughs> really been motivated to um, uh, really get into the weeds with AI and chat GBT. Um, if, you know, if I was uh, 20 years younger, if I was your age, um, or even 10 years younger, I would be all over it. So now I know about it, but not enough to be, you know, give a, 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 a really smart a comment about it. So are you telling me, John Follows, that you've put the chat GPT aside for the band? You, you becoming a rock star? You know, that's one of the things on my bucket list. Yes. Let's talk. Oh, I'm running out of time, my friend. You know, there's not a lot of time left at this stage. So, um, Tonight, I am going to drive up the road about uh, 30 minutes and meet with my uh, musical buddy who plays the bass, and we're going to jam for about two hours and work on our songs. That, that is exceptional. I'm going to drive up the road with my buddy. We're going to jam for a couple hours, and we're working our songs, says the 17-year-old young man sitting in the lab today talking about his experience in the ad agency, John Follis. Uh, what is it? With, so I've had a number of people come in the lab. Uh, around our demographic, around our demo, John, that are 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 destined to becoming rock stars, and it's it's we this romantic idea of a rock star, isn't there, John? You know, ever since I again dating myself, ever since I saw the Beatles, uh, you know, on the Ed Sullivan Show when I was nine yep. years old, uh, like me and like everyone else my age, you know, you you want to be a, a rock star, you want to be a Beatle. And I, you know, shortly after that, I started taking guitar lessons. I was 13 when my dad, my dad was, I had the best dad, I have to say. Um, one day he came home and said, listen, I think you, you know, everyone should learn an instrument. I just think it's a, a good thing to do. What, what instrument do you want to learn how to play? And I said, guitar. And two weeks later, he came home with a used guitar and said, your lessons start Thursday. That's <laughs> so, pretty cool. Yeah. So I re I'm really grateful for that because uh, playing guitar has been a passion. But because, you know, I've always been most of my life, I've been focused on my career and other more important things. I really never focused on it enough to really take it serious enough to, you know, be in a band and focus on a band. So now that I have the time to focus on whatever I want to do, that's one of the things I, I really enjoy doing. Love it. I, I, I love it. And I, and I applaud you for, for taking that path. John, before we sat down and the camera started rolling, you said, hey, I did my homework on you and I should be, I should be the one interviewing you. And I said, well, hey, 
Let's have a conversation. Let's just have it back and forth. Uh, because I, like you, worked in a similar industry prior to becoming this talk show host guy that I am now, apparently. So, um, you know, you did some research on me. You, you, you might have some questions. Let's have a dialogue. What do you want to throw over here to Uncle Keith? Yeah, so very impressive. You bootstrapped your first business and sold it for $50 million, right? I did. Yeah, I did. I uh, started a social media business back as social media was was uh, becoming a thing. Uh, you know, YouTube was just being sold to Google at the time and Twitter was brand new. So I, like yourself, I've been around a little bit and we anticipated there was going to be a need for moderating content because people were posting at the time user generated content. Now we call it social media. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another. We found a niche niche down, solved the problem, John, and just kept solving it over and over and over and over and over. Well, that, that's impressive. So does that mean you're a 50 millionaire? Yeah, no. Uh, so I'm in Canada. We have free health care, right? So we have a big tax. So, you know, there's big tax base here in this country where, you know, what, 53% of my dollar goes to uh, the government. And wow. Wow. I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you quickly take off half, right? Um, you know, I've, I've been through a journey of life. I've, I've, I've been through divorce, so you got to take another half, right? So, you know, it, it all, it all just starts to, uh, so just, you only, you only have 13 million. Another well, uh, you know, it's <laughs> Canadian no, I'm doing the math, Keith. I'm doing the math. 13 no. million. 12. No, 5. no, 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 no. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're enjoying coming to work and Hey, listen, I got kids that are growing. I got three children that are, that are, that have the, that have the world as their oyster in front of them and, and, uh, want to empower them, uh, to, to, you know, hopefully achieve greatness. So whatever we can oh, do to, to nine, we're down to 9 million down now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know about that, John. No, we're, uh, we're doing what we can. I, they, yeah. right. this, I was in the cannabis industry for a while in the market, you know, on the investment side. So take half of that off. So, oh, you know, okay. wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's you know, there's a story to everything, right? Yeah, there is. There there's, is. There's always context. Well, listen, it, it's it's still impressive. And uh, thank you. You know, when I read that, I said, "Wow, that's that's." You don't hear very often people who bootstrapped a company and sold it for fifty million. So that's very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, and then I was very fortunate, John, to uh, not only sell it. Uh, so I was I sold to Aegis Media back at the time. I'm not sure if you remember. So the three holding companies, right? You have Aegis, Publicis, and and uh, oh shit, uh, the big one uh wpp so we were sold omnicom, to, omnicom? Okay. omnicom yeah omnicom yeah so we we sold into a aegis at the time who's then bought by densu uh so i was very fortunate that you know uh we were bought uh, and at the time because our business was so unique john they really didn't know where to put us and they had a real difficult time integrating us into the industry into this marketing ad industry right because our, our our buyer was not the typical buyer uh, but we were uh, extremely profitable and uh, we made great margins. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I can tell you that the network got addicted to our margins and uh, uh, it was it was a good thing. We ran a good, healthy business, great margins, but they really didn't know where to put us. Uh, so I was very fortunate that, that I was able to run the company for 10 years. So not only did I bootstrap it as an entrepreneur, uh, I was able to sell it and then stay on as the CEO for 10 years uh, before we uh, went our separate ways in February of 2021. Um, so I've, I've had, you know, the experience of, of both. Uh, and then like you probably heard in my monologue, the entire business, John was, was remote. It was virtual, right? So I was running a, a virtual business before the internet was really, before right. the infrastructure of the internet exists like it does today. Yeah. You know, I checked out your LinkedIn profile as well. And I was trying, I didn't see any, um, documentation about your academic background. I was curious uh, whether you were self-taught about all this tech stuff, social media stuff, or whether you you actually went to school for it. Yeah, a great question. Thank you. Uh, I did not finish school. Uh, I went to high school. Uh, I did not finish college. I am a self-taught, uh, roll up my sleeves uh, doer. And as we talked before the show, um, I would challenge anybody listening or anybody in my, in my orbit to outwork me. Uh, or to out show up me. I, I'm very proud of my Canadian work ethic, and uh, I believe that that's you know what that I'm a I'm a big believer in hard work, and I'm, I'm and that's it's my brand. You know, I show up every single day. I put the work in, and I'm self taught. Really, that's where I'm all from. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting because I you know when you raise that, I've been having this conversation with some people as of late around education, 
and the future and generative AI. And, and, you know, I've been talking with my kids around, you know, so I, I don't know if university and college is as important as it was when you and I are growing up. I don't know because knowledge is a commodity now. Knowledge is just, is, is it's immediate and it's instant. The experience that you have and I have uh, is of more value today than it's ever been because you've lived experiences that you can share with people, right? So I'm starting to ask myself, you know, when, when, you know, when I was growing up, my mom and dad were like, hey, go get your ticket. Go get your blue collar ticket. Go become a plumber. Go become an electrician. The point I'm making, John, is that that was a skill. It was a go learn a skill because you can monetize that skill. What seems to be apparent today as, we're, as the world continues to be digitized is that we are encouraging our human beings to go gain those white collar skills. Go and become a great copywriter. Go and become a ghostwriter. Go and become a designer. Go and become a something and then sell that knowledge. You follow me? Yeah. Well, I, th I think what you're saying is true uh, partially. Uh, I think it really dep depends on the profession you go into. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about your back, your uh, business and your focus, the, the technology, the digital world, mm -hmm. the way that the digital world is progressing, it's outpacing the academic world. You, mm -hmm. can't, you, can't, you can't get instructors really that, can teach it fast enough. You can, there's so much information online. If you have an interest in that stuff that, uh, I agree with you that you don't necessarily, uh, in that industry, the digital world need an education as much as another profession. Um, I, I went to, I studied advertising at Syracuse university, which had one of the best programs in the country for advertising and copywriting. And, um, I, I would not have been able to learn that on my own. I really, they had instructors and also I continued my education when I was in New York. I went to uh, one of the best schools, another one of the best schools in country school of visual arts, which is in Manhattan and, and took night classes there. Mm. And those classes were taught by working professionals who would work during the day and at night they'd, they teach at SVA. And um, that cla those classrooms uh, at those schools were, an, an education that I would never uh, prepared me in ways that I would never be able to do on my own if I didn't go to those schools. So again, it, I think it depends, but for what you're talking about, I would agree with you. If you're talking about AI and some of the stuff now, uh, I think all you need to do is have an interest in it and, and be willing to spend the time mm -hmm. uh, with what's available on the internet. And that, that will be your, your classroom. What, what's making me curious is the power of the value in, 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 a, in a knowledge brand. So for example, let me, let me follow my thought through. Typically we would be encouraging our kids to go to Harvard. I'm just picking a school at it. Go, go to Harvard. Cause there's a brand Harvard. You're going to get a great education there. But the thing is, John Harvard is not doing the teaching. There's an instructor there named John Follis who's doing the teaching. So I'm wondering to myself whether tomorrow's John Follis's are still going to Harvard to teach or if they're saying to themselves, well, wait a minute, I'm an expert. I'm going to build up my tribe and I'm going to create the John Follis Institute of ads advertising. And people are going to come to John Follis because I am the brand. And you're seeing that shift where, where personal brands and the knowledge of, of, of you, of me is of more value perhaps than the overriding brand that we work for, which is why you heard me say in my monologue, if I'm running a company, which I am, I want all of my team to have massive audiences massive power. I want every single, if you were working, I want John Follis to have a big audience. I want John Follis to be an expert in his field because your brand brings more value to my brand. Yeah. Well, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think you make a good point that um, just because you go to a school like Harvard doesn't mean you're going to be taught by the best instructors. Um, I found that out actually at Syracuse because the first advertising course I took at Syracuse was taught by someone teaching there who actually was a Madison Avenue guy and um, did not get along with him at all. I never worked harder for a class in my life talking about working hard. I mean, I would, I would pull all nighters trying to do the best work possible for this class and this instructor. And with about three weeks left to go in the class, he pulled me aside and said, um, listen, uh, kid, um, I don't think you have the talent for this industry. I would, uh, I would encourage you to drop the class because uh, your grades suck and I just don't think you have the talent. Now, you know, thank God I didn't listen to that guy, but that goes to your point that just because you, you are an instructor at a good school doesn't mean that um, you're a good instructor. Um, 
the problem is, is that when you're a student, you don't know, you go to Harvard and, you know, I think for the overwhelming majority of instructors at Hartford, at Harvard, like at Syracuse, they're good, but, um, it doesn't mean that's the only place you could get an education. You don't necessarily, again, go back to what I was saying earlier. It really depends, uh, what kind of education you're trying to get, what kind of profession you're going into. Um, and then you, you, I think, you know, in certain areas, it does help to go to a good school because generally those schools have the best uh, people teaching. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if that's changing. And I'm wondering if the power dynamic is changing where the person does not need to go to Harvard to become the best teacher, whether they're going to learn from somebody else and then become their own brand. It depends. And listen, not everyone is as entrepreneurial as you and I. Right. That's, so, these, these guys are academics. Yes. So they're not thinking about their personal brand. Right. Yes. Good They're point. Thinking, I, I, I know this. I'm, I'm getting ready to retire. I, I, I love, you know, I want to help the next generation. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I so do. They're, they're not, they're not, uh, not everyone has the, the, the passion. You, you know, to be an entrepreneur and do the stuff you're talking about, it takes a lot of passion, which you obviously have. You know, I was going to say, I think you need to come out of your shell more. You're a little bit too, too introverted. Um, so I, it's funny because I am an introvert. I had this conversation with my colleague earlier this week. She's like, you're not an introvert. And I go, actually, I am. Yes, I, I, uh, so put me in a room with a lot of people and I, you'll find me in the corner. I, I'm, you know, I, uh, the, I, I like, you heard me. I, I, my whole career is behind a camera. My whole career is behind a microphone. This, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable here. That's, that's, that's me. I'm the same way. Um, I'm basically an introvert as, as well, but I, I love doing this. I love talking yes. about things I'm interested in with yes. people who are interested in yes. it. Not, listen, I've been on probably 75 podcasts in the last uh, year and a half talking about different business related things. And, a lot of the hosts I, I, I talk, I engage with, don't really have the energy that I think is important to have as a host. So, you know, good for you for Thank bringing you. that energy to your podcast. That's a real asset. And I think, you know, that's going to contribute, contribute, contribute to your success. But um, where were we going with this? Um, I feel like brand and entrepreneurs and just in, in, in yeah. the drive. It's, it's funny, John, because I say, I've said to somebody, somebody, come, somebody came to this, you know, Keith, I'm thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. I'm going to go on my own. I was like, oh, yeah. They're like, oh yeah. I go, I'll tell you what, I got some advice for you. They're like, their ears perked up. They're like, oh yeah, what's the advice, Uncle Keith? What's the advice, Keith? I'm like, well, I would suggest before you become an entrepreneur, you either go and run a marathon or go climb a mountain. They're like, what? I go, because I've done one of them. I've I've climbed a mountain and I've started some businesses. Climbing a mountain is much easier than starting a business. Go save yourself tons of money. Go save yourself tons of heartache. Go save yourself the discipline of, of all of that. And if you enjoy the marathon training experience or the, yeah. or the, or the climbing a mountain experience, yeah. yes, go consider being an entrepreneur. Yeah. I, I, really, I really believe that. Go take 100 days of your life and go and kill yourself and then decide whether you want to go on for the next 300 days of your life. And a lot of people are not willing to do that. No, they're they're entrepreneurs. Yeah. I, I think you have to you have to love the challenge. You have to yes. love love the journey. And I'll just mention this because it it kind of ties into what you just said. I was going through a very difficult time in my uh, agency partnership, and I had a vacation coming up. And I said, well, I could go to Club Med and sit on a beach and drink a pina colada, or I could do something else. And I don't know if you know what Outward Bound is. Have you heard of Outward Bound? I don't think I have. Okay. Outward bound is something that's been in the U.S. and I perhaps around the country for maybe 50 years. It's a program um, that's a, a, an adventure vacation where you go to some uh, place in the world and for the next week or two weeks, however long you do it, you are then um, out in the wilderness doing things like climbing mountains or going yeah. down rapids or, yeah. or, or doing these, um, I forget what they call them, these, 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 these challenges, these physical challenges, almost like um, military training, like boot camp in yeah. a way. Yeah. You know, where it's, it's not sitting on a beach drink, having a drink. It's you're, 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 you're challenge, you're challenging your, your, mental and physical uh, uh, self to to succeed at these various physical challenges out in nature. So I did two of those. One of them was um, in Colorado climbing the second highest peak in the Rocky Mountains. Nice. And you know you and you're camping, you know, you're 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 out in the wilderness for a week. You have guides, you have two yeah. le you know leaders doing this stuff, but 
you're also doing things things that I've never done before, like um, like repelling off the side of a cliff where you're strapped in and you're going down holding a rope and things like that. And you know, you you kind of don't want to look down because there's 800 feet down to a rocky ravine that you know. Was this work stuff? This was a this was my vacation. Yeah. So I so to me, you're living life. And to me, what you're doing on that vacation is what I would be doing with people for work. I I, I think the world has work all ass backwards, John. Like I really do. I, I think I think it's we're all so focused on well, you heard me rant with PowerPoint. Oh, I got I gotta spend the next 40 hours making a PowerPoint to go present to somebody. I got an idea. Let's go and do some rock climbing. Let's go trek a trail. Let's go and go for a bike ride. Let's go be human beings, go be creative. You know, um, be creative, be human, uh, go live life, enjoy life. And in my experience, results are going to come from that. Like, I feel like the world's just ass backwards right now. And that's why I like the shift happening around this debate around remote and hybrid and virtual, because we have been raised. Well, you and I have been around long enough to be raised with a lunchbox. Put our lunchbox in hand, go to the factory, work Monday to Friday, eight to five, you're done. Ah, That's not not the world anymore, man. Go and Go live in Costa Rica and go climb mountains and go spend an hour with your creative team, come up with creative ideas and get results done for your client. Well, it, it, if you do something like that, uh, whether it's, you know, in the gym doing, yeah. uh, you know, 50 pushups or whatever uh, f- that you didn't think you could ever do, um, then it it helps train your mind that yeah. you can succeed at something you didn't think yes. or didn't assume that you could su- succeed at. You're out of your comfort zone. Yes. And being an entrepreneur is the parallel there. It's being out of your comfort zone. Right. And so that's why there is, I think, a parallel to what, you know, mm-hmm. what we're talking about. Well, h- hence the business athlete performance lab, because I'm, I'm a big believer that the same principles that apply to being a successful athlete are the same principles that apply to being a, su- a successful business person. Put them in a blender and you get performance, which is really not about. And in my world, John, performance is not about winning the cup. It's not about summiting the mountain. Performance is the entire journey along the way to the top of the mountain, to the bottom of the mountain. That's the performance. The performance is the journey, right? And then, of course, you got the lab. When you, when you go to a lab, John, what do you do? You attempt. You try. You, you're permitted to fail because in a lab, you can experiment, right? And when, you, and when you're permitted to fail, what do you do? You get up and you try again. Right. What, what, what a powerful space to empower creativity when you're encouraging yourself to fail. Right. I, I got to tell you a funny story. So I've done uh, three, three outward bounds, I think. Yeah. So uh, the first one, I did that repelling. They call it repelling where you're strapped in and you basically start walking down a cliff yes. you know, with your feet on the rock. You know what repelling is, right? 100%, yes. So the next outward bound, they say, okay, they, they kind of fresh group of people, but I'm thinking I'm the pro at this because I've done it previously at the other outward bound. So any volunteers who wants to go first, and of course I raise my hand, this will be a piece of cake. I've done it before. They strap me in and I start going down the mountain and I slip and I find myself hanging by a rope upside down with my feet above my head, with my back against flat against the side of a cliff (laughs) upside down. Oh my goodness. And the gravity is forcing me, pressuring me against this mountain upside down. And you think, oh, well, just flip yourself back up. Not so easy to do. No. When gravity is pulling you down and your back is facing the mountain. It took me probably 10 minutes to, and and you know, it's not like they could, they could pull you back up by the rope because you're down there about, you know, 20, 30 feet and they can't just pull the rope and drag you up that easily. So you have to figure it out. (laughs) Otherwise you're just going to be hanging there (laughs) for the rest of the day. Yes. Yes. Literally. Again, it's, it's, it's problem solving. And, uh, you know, and the first thing you have to do, you know, your, your gut reactions, get out of here and you, and you start getting really anxious and you, you try everything and you realize after the first three or four minutes, that's not going to work. So you just have to like, really just relax. Yes. Calm you down. Take it, take, take a couple deep breaths and think about it and just take it slow and take it slow. And if you calm down, and don't get all freaked out about the fact that you're hanging upside down on the side of a cliff. Then that's what enabled me to, to eventually write myself back up. John, any parting words to say goodbye here before? You know, we've been chatting for an hour here already, believe it or not. Uh, I, we probably can go on for many more. Uh, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed your company. I've thoroughly enjoyed the, the, the back and forth dialogue. Closing words, closing comments, closing questions you want to throw on the table before we say goodbye. 
No, I, it's, uh, I can't believe it's been an hour at a time. It just uh, it went yeah. by really fast, but uh, that's, that's the sign of a good interview, right? When it goes by fast. So I just, again, uh, compliment you on your, your show and your energy. Thank you. And, Appreciate uh, that. You know, just keep it up and, you know, build, keep building that audience because I think, uh, you know, you have, you're, you're giving a lot of good information to people who could really benefit from it. I really appreciate that. We're, you know, we're, we're trying, we're really trying hard and, and, uh, it's a crowded world, right. For people's attention. So it's, it's constant iterating. It's constantly talking to the audience. It's constantly finding great, you know, great guests like yourself to have good dialogue and, and, and take feedback and learn and, and just keep giving back. Right. So we're trying. And as I said at the beginning, I, I'm, I believe that if I can show up for my audience every single day and they can, they can, they can see that, that, uh, Hey, just like you and I grew up, we knew that every single night at 1130, David Letterman was on, right? It's like, you just knew I'm going to bed with Letterman. I'm, I'm going to turn Letterman on. I'm going to turn. It's just that. And I'm trying to build that same habit, right? Well, oh, Bill is popping up my LinkedIn feed again at noon. It's just always popping up. He's everything is just there. Right. So, and give people that comfort and then give people the confidence. And then uh, who knows what happens from there? Yeah. Well, good luck. Good luck with it, Keith. And again, thanks for having me on your show. It's been a lot of fun chatting. Awesome. So I'm going to stick you back into the green room for a second. I'm going to turn my attention to the camera over here and say goodbye to the audience and then come back and walk you out. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Hang tight one sec. I'm going to do this, do that. Oh, hey, it worked pretty good today. Wow. Look at that. It doesn't always work for me, as you guys know. So, but it did today. Hey, we got some music coming in here. We're exiting. We got some new graphics working. Whoa, you guys, if you guys tune into the show every single day for the last 700 years, you've noticed that we've upped the production quality today. So I was messing around with some graphical changes. I seem kind of blurry here, so I got to fix that up. But anyways, hey, listen, I hope you enjoyed the chat with me and John today. John Follis, ad agency guy, not fired seven times. Sorry, John. Sorry, audience. I misled you at the beginning of our show today. Not seven times, only four. Only four times. Hey, y'all got to start somewhere. Four gets you to seven. Speaking of four to seven, I go seven days a week showing up here in the lab. Monday to Monday, noon central, minus six GMT. Fascinating conversations. Fascinating people. Energy accountability, and a hell of a lot of fun. You're John. It's okay. I like what you're doing over here. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. we got another guest. We do have another guest tomorrow. Let me just pull it up on the old calendar. Um, tomorrow we have Chris McCarthy joining us here in the lab. Thursday, noon, central, minus six GMT, LinkedIn, X, and YouTube. I'm out of here.